So we've been in Jonah, and we've seen where Jonah has gone. Jonah was told by God where he's supposed to be. And what does Jonah do? Jonah, in the course of a verse and a half of Scripture, decides he knows better than God, and he says, I ain't doing it. For, for reasons we, we've talked about even that could, could be justifiable in, in his own mind. I mean, after all, this, who, the, Jonah was asked to take a message to his enemies. Of, uh, that He was ta- to take a, a basically what equated to a gospel message to his enemies. The biggest fear Jonah may have had, on top of the fact that he just knew they were going to kill him, was that they would actually turn from their sins and their wicked ways. I mean, Jonah, after all, I mean, these people had been nothing but, a, but heartburn to him. They, they, had, they had done things to his people. They had been brutal to his people. Any chance they got to hurt his people, they did it. And then Jonah's saying, God, why are you sending me to these people? They don't deserve grace. They don't deserve your love. Of course, for Jonah to say that meant that somehow the Israelites did deserve God's love. After all, they've been so good. <laughs> It'd been a never-ending cycle of, of you know, the, uh, of, of uh, disobeying God, getting all in trouble. God sends a deliverer, and they, over and over and over again, a never-ending cycle. Some of you are going, yeah, it was my childhood. <laughs> That's what it was like. But the thing is, Jonah didn't want to carry this message, and he ran. He decides to run. We know where Jonah ends up. Last week, we talked about that big fish. That, that Jonah ended up in, that big fish, not necessarily a whale, but a big fish that, that either, either God created and, and made for the occasion or sent to where Jonah was for the occasion to be both his torment and his deliverer. It, both. It was both. Jonah got to experience in, in many ways of that feeling of being in the very pit Pit. In a book called 23 Minutes in Heaven, uh, written, written by a man claims to have, in, in fact, uh, had, had been through and experienced what it would be like to be in hell. And it, he speaks of the pit, that pit, that pit of despair, that pit of hopelessness. And we see that, that Jonah experienced a little bit of that sense of hopelessness being in the pit. And yet, somehow, days went by and he was delivered from that pit. In fact, we see, and this morning I thank George for singing, kind of singing through the scriptures for us this morning. As, as, he, as he prayed, he, he, he sang through the prayer of Jonah. How Jonah literally cried out to God. He said, you know, I cried out to you and I feel like I'd been cast out of your sight. After all... As, as much as hell is a place of torment, hell is a place of utter despair, of no hope, what could be worse than feeling like God no longer acknowledges or knows you exist? Would that not be a literal hell in some ways? Now we see here that Jonah even says he got some of those feelings being down in the belly of this big fish. And somehow living through being in the belly of this big fish, talking about the water surrounding him and, and that, that feeling, that, that icky feeling, that, that disgusting feeling. I don't know about you, but I hate getting stuff on my hands, sticky stuff or slick stuff. I hate it. I just, it, literally, if you want to drive me crazy, do that to me. You better not. But, but, but it, I can't stand it, but if you, I can't imagine the torment of being surrounded by it. Literally, being like sinking into that feeling. And, 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 and so Jonah, finally, he's crying out and he's praying. And he even goes to the point to say that, God, you, you, literally, you literally have delivered me up. You've brought up my life. I mean, you've literally taken me and, and lifted me up out of the pit. You've done it. You've done that in my life. And so now it comes to that place where he's been delivered. And we, we spoke about his deliverance, his deliverance being that he was literally 
he was, he was Ubered onto the coast uh, with, with vomit, and he was thrown onto the coast there, literally thrown up by the, way, up at the, by the fish, the big fish. And, and when he, it, then he reaches that point, and now it says that after this has happened, he gets a second chance. Let me ask you this. You ever, have you ever seen, been to that point where God's delivered you out of something? He, he's literally taken you, he, you know, it could have been from a self-induced thing that you did. You sinned. You messed up. And, and God somehow ends up then delivering you, and he gives you a second chance. I can think of sometimes, I, I, I can even go back to some of my, my, my stupid days, uh, but I can think about those moments where the weekend came and I was in high school and I thought I was going to be real slick and I was going to hide the alcohol from my parents. After all, I was a preacher's kid. And, and, I, and, and I, I'd go out drinking with my friends and I'd get up that next morning and I would be like, man, I'm never doing this ever again. After the feeling I felt and the sickness I felt that morning, I'm never, I'm never doing this again. I'm done. I'm never, I'm never going to do this. Oh, I, can't, I can't do this again. And what do we end up doing? You do it again. You do it again. You do it again. You get caught up in it. In the case of Jonah, though, Jonah has sinned. He's been delivered. And now, God, go, the word of God comes to him again. He gives him a second chance. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Jonah, Jonah, he says, Now the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach it. To preach to it that message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh should be overthrown. There's some missing pieces to this story that I just want to ask questions if I could. You know, when you're reading Scripture, it's okay to have a question. It's okay to read something going, hey, there's, there's a couple of parts in here they don't mention. One of which is that Jonah got vomited up on the shore and, and then has to travel to Nineveh. Where did he get his clothes? I mean, can you imagine the clothes he had on? They were probably, they probably dissolved and disintegrated. So, so what exactly, what was Jonah wearing when he entered the city. I mean, was he dressed up nice? Was he dressed to the nines? You know, was he was he all fancied up? Chances are he wasn't. Chances are he's in pretty bad shape. He probably looked disgusting. We've even talked. That, there's been some cases where it, it talked about the gastric juices and how they can probably like make the skin kind of pale out the skin or or, or ruin the pigments in the skin. So, if nothing, Jonah probably looked nasty. Now, and, and then he's sent to the city, and he literally is walking down the city, and he's preaching a message saying, in 40 days you'll be destroyed. Why did they listen to him? It wasn't because he was dressed nice, they, but they heard the message that Jonah was giving. They, they literally, in other words, that message, and by the way, this city, this city of Nineveh, as it's, as it's described to us here, was enormous in size. It wasn't like a little, like a podunk town, you know, the one town so, where they got the sign that says entering and leaving on the same sign. It's not that kind of a town. This was a, a mega, megapolis. This was a huge city. It was, it was a, literally, it would take literally three days to walk through the city because you would have to stop and then walk some more. So if you can imagine that, it reminds me of that story of a, the Texan who says, yeah, you know what, I... I can I can get on my property and I can drive for I can drive for two days and not make it to the end of my property. The guy he was talking to said I had a car like that once, but but no, this was real. This was real. This was literally a, a three days walk, and he finally would get to the other side of the city. So that that was kind of the setup of this. So 
He's giving this message, constantly saying, in 40 days, you're, you're going to be overthrown. You're, you're going to be destroyed, overthrown. And then something happened, something that, that really Jonah didn't want to happen. In verse 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when we talk about sackcloth, we literally are talking about burlap sackcloth. Just, just if you can imagine, the, the, and the idea behind it is a contrite spirit, a repentant heart, a humble heart. Not dressing up and putting makeup on and, and trying to look real nice, but actually presenting themselves to say, we are sorry. We are sorry. We repent. And, and, there, and the, the word of what Jonah was saying was carrying through the whole city. And what's amazing about this is there wasn't even CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, and the message got out. It was everywhere. People knew about Jonah. They, they knew what was happening. And so it, they, they declared this, this time, and it says that even to the least of them they were doing that. They all looked the same. And then the word came to the king of Nineveh, verse 6, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, you ready for this? Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man with beast be covered with a sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? This is a whole nation that came to repentance. Let me ask you this about, about the United States. What is it going to take for the United States to have this kind of a contrite heart, this repentant heart? You see, right now we can't seem to agree on what, what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is not. And, and yet we have the Word of God. Those that are true believers, even the ones that are in this room right now, if you are a genuine believer in Christ, you have no doubts about what truth is, do you? Don't get sucked in. Don't get sucked into the political landscape that will try to change your view of what is right and what is wrong. It has not become uh, it has not become right to, to abort a baby, to kill an infant. That hasn't become right. In fact, in the, in the Old Testament, it was a form of pagan worship to sacrifice babies. So don't think that it is right to do that because the Bible tells us and teaches us it is a sin. It is a sin to murder. You see, there, there are so many things in our current landscape that are not up for debate about being right or wrong. You are a believer in Christ, and you have a roadmap for what is really right and what is really wrong. Oh, do, you want, do we want to argue the, the doctrinal thing sometimes and kind of getting good? To, oh, sure, we can have great discussions. But do not ever think that there is room for compromise in what God says is right and what God says is wrong, or sin for that matter. In this case here, the people of Nineveh have come to this place, and it's amazing that this happened. because This wasn't a, ci a city of a few. It was a huge city. I mean, this was roughly about 760 B.C. In fact, we are only about 38 years from the, the, the Assyrians coming in and completely destroying Israel. They will come in only 38 years because, you see, this just wasn't about God relenting on destroying or, or doing something to Nineveh, but it was also buying time for Israel to get their hearts right. Verse 10 of chapter 3 says, Then God said, 
saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way. And God relented from disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. You think, okay, this is awesome. Jonah's message has now caused a, a revival to break out in Nineveh May, for the first time even. Maybe we won't call it a revival because this is the first time God has become uh, uh, brought to, he's been brought to the front in Nineveh. And you see how happy Jonah was about it. Wow. It says in verse chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah <laughs> exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know... See, Jonah, this is where he willfully sinned. I know that you are a gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, you ready for this? Oh, Lord, please take my life from me. Kill me. Kill me now. For it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> so what's Jonah's response to the move of God? And by the way, he's not the first. We see examples of prophets of God where they have literally given up and said, man, I can't. I don't want to do this. Just take me on. Just take me on. We see it in Daniel. Daniel, we see that we see that in Elijah. We see these prophets of God which which have reached at moments reached certain points in their life where they were discouraged. But in the case of Jonah, Jonah literally says, "Lord, take me. I I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm just done. I don't want I don't I don't want to do this. I I want just take me." And then it says in verse 4, then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Because here's the problem. When we get mad at God for something he's doing for someone else, that whether you want to call it jealousy or anything else, what we are actually saying is that, Lord, I am better than that person over there. I'm better. I'm better than them. So why are you doing that for them over there? Why are you doing that? Why are you forgiving them? They don't deserve your forgiveness, but the presumption is that we do. The Bible teaches us that there is not one of us in this room that's righteous. None of us. We all fail miserably. Romans 3.23 says we're, we're all sinners. We're, we're falling, we fall short of God's glory every day that we live. We do it. And yet, in the case of Jonah, he's angry. Verse 5 says, So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. I think Jonah's still hoping that they get, they get their clock cleaned. I think he's hoping that, that something's going to happen to them. And it says, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that, that it withered, and it happened when the sun rose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And then he wished death for himself. Again, what, what does he wish death? And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. You see, God's teaching him a lesson. By the way, never think that God's doing stuff for you just to toy with you. Because he's teaching Jonah a lesson. It's just that Jonah's a hard head, just like us. And he's got to do, he has to do like really awful things to him to get him to listen so he can teach him. It says that, verse 9, Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about this plan? Is it right? And he said, is, it, it is right for me to be angry, even to death, Jonah. 
But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hands and their left and much livestock? So you hear what God's saying? God, God's saying, should I not? You know, here you are worried about a stupid plant. Pitiful plant, you know, wah, wah. But, but, but he says, but, but here you have 120,000 plus people over there who I was about to destroy, and you don't have pity on them. By the way, you think there's supposed to be a chapter 5 here. Here's what I say to that. This, this story has, left so, has been left so open-ended. It, it, there, there's really not a conclusion. It doesn't say that Jonah turned out to get his heart right and kind of get in the right frame of mind. It doesn't say that. It just leaves this story open for us. We don't know what happened to Jonah. Jonah. Remember, I, we don't even know if Jonah lived another 38 years to see his people carried out of, of uh, Samaria with fish hooks in their mouth. We don't even know if, if he was living to see that. All we see is that Jonah was left bitter and upset with God because he was merciful to their enemies. And by the way, this, this leaves this story open for us. What about you today? There, there may be those out there that you are embittered toward. Let me share. Let me get personal for a minute. It's not okay to hold bitterness and hate in your heart for anybody. Anybody. That would go for race, that would go for individuals, that would go for family, but it's not okay. Today, maybe someone here has, has an open-ended story going on in their life, and they need to settle it once and for all. They need to get their heart right. And you know what? You can't control how the other person or the other, the other person's going to respond to you. But you can make it right in your heart. It's time to stop the junk. Don't, don't you go around with bitterness and anger in your heart. The Bible says, if I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, that the Lord's not going to hear me. So you can pray all day, but if you hold bitterness in your heart, if you, if you have that iniquity in your heart, God isn't hearing a word you say. Get it right. Don't wait. Don't delay. Get your heart where it needs to be. Maybe you've made a career out of being bitter and being hateful. And I speak to politicians as well as individuals here. It's time to stop the bitterness, the hatred, the anger. It's time to stop marketing it to try to get what you want. And it's time for us to show uh, a true, sincere love of people like you've never done before. The world needs it. This nation needs it. We're never going to agree on what completely is right and what completely is wrong as a nation. But as believers in Christ, we better believe completely what is right and what is wrong today.